back to the beginning. I'm sure. I won't give all that introductory material again. I'll just start at this slide right up here. We're on day two of the lecture talking about how to get... You good? Great. All right. So we're talking about how to get an efficiency gain with a new approach, all right, through combustion. All right, so a little bit different topic than an approach than we were talking about yesterday. So let's move on here. Again, I go back to if I was worried about capturing carbon dioxide, I have two things that I can do to change the efficiency. One is improve the efficiency of the capture, but then the other one is how do I get the generator efficiency much higher? Yesterday we talked about supercritical CO2 as one approach to raise up the efficiency that's different than other approaches have been used in the past. Today we're going to shift gears and look at a technology for turbine power generation, gas turbine power generation. Everybody's familiar with turbines as a technology for transportation, right? They're on most large commercial airliners and probably all of you are familiar with the fact we use turbines significantly to generate electric power right now at least in this country and uh, abroad as well. Uh, today, if you're going to install a new power plant at large scale, it's probably going to be a gas turbine. I put up on the slide there some estimates uh, from Forecast International about where turbine sales are going to go over the next few years. And that one estimate there says through 2030, 12,000 gas turbines sold into the power generating industry. You know, 2030 is not that far away, 12,000, you do the math, there's a lot of turbines going to be sold every year for power generation alone, all right? If you read further on that chart, it talks about the oil and gas industry being a big customer for smaller industrial machines. And uh, that's an interesting set of statistics there. You can see as well on that slide, they're talking about 10,000 gas turbines sold into that industry. And it, if, if you work in the area of stationary power turbines, those types of turbines are quite different in terms of their layout, in terms of their operation. Most of the work that DOE is actually doing is for, as you'd understand, electric power generation. Perhaps an equal opportunity is there for people who want to pursue turbine development for oil and gas. We don't currently have a lot of research funding devoted to that area, so I'm just pointing that out. It's something to think about. How might the work you're doing help another part of the industry for gas turbines? In the oil and gas industry, they're going to have to meet stringent emission standards as well. They also have to be able to load follow because their demand goes up and down depending on what they're doing on their oil platform or their drilling need. A lot of gas turbines, uh, you know, the interesting thing about a gas turbine, you can run it on natural gas fuel, which we have a lot of in the United States because of the shale gas revolution. Uh, you can run it on gasified coal. Uh, the picture that you see in the lower, your lower left there, that coal gasification plant, that's a now actually uh, mature coal gasification plant in Tampa, Florida. has a couple of old, older 7FA gas turbines, I think that's right, uh, that are operated from a gasifier. So you can use coal in gas turbines very easily. There's not as many installations that do that. Why? Because natural gas is inexpensive right now. Right, so that's why people are gravitating toward you know, using gas turbines on natural gas. Uh, and by the way, you can look at the projection going forward out to 2040 for the amount of natural gas that's available, that's, that's US based, uh, there's a lot of natural gas available. Production is going to keep climbing. So I expect there'll be a, a lot of opportunity to improve gas turbines over the next decades here. So let's look back at the history of gas turbine efficiency. The combined cycle gas turbine efficiency, uh, I don't know if the gentleman's in the audience, I don't think he was, he pointed out, he said, I said, what's the efficiency, 61%. He was right even just like, what, a year and a half back. The efficiency has been going steadily on that plot you can see back from 1970, about a half a percent a year. So if you read the literature, there's people claiming 63% efficiency. By the way, if you work in this area, realize almost all gas-fired conversion equipment they report their efficiency on LHV, just the way it is. All the coal people, coal power plants, report efficiency on HHV. So save yourself some embarrassment as you are working in those areas because you can get confused comparing the efficiencies because they are quite different. Natural gas efficiency on LHV is about 4% lower than its HHV. With coal plants, it's about 2%. So just a little 
pointer there as you think about efficiency. What do we do to make a step change in efficiency for gas turbines? I know that line is going up and you might say, well, I'll just wait. You know, if I wait 10 years at a half percent a year, I got 5%. At some point, we're going to hit, you know, the material limits that until there's a new development of material, we're probably going to be stuck. So we want to be working today on what's the next thing, right? How do I change the efficiency dramatically? We know we've got some room to go. If I look at a gas turbine firing at 1600 centigrade, the Carnot efficiency there, you know, rejecting a cold ambient, it's as high as 84%. So it's, I know I'm not proposing the impossible here, but I want to take a big jump in efficiency. How might I do it? Well, you know, the first and most obvious thing, and it is practice, you take a turbine, which has a finite expansion ratio, so its exhaust temperature is going to be determined by that expansion ratio, and you match that up with a steam cycle or a supercritical CO2 bottoming cycle, something down there, make a combined cycle, that's how you get 63% efficiency, right? So that's already been done. The cycle configuration that's ideally suited to that particular temperature window, how do I get at still another step change in efficiency? Well, it, uh, it makes sense if you want a step change in efficiency to look for where's the biggest loss of available work in that power cycle, right? Where's the thing that's the biggest place I'm losing my opportunity to do work? And, you know, I have to admit, I told you yesterday I was teasing, I enjoyed thermodynamics, but I don't know why it didn't occur to me very early on as a student that the absolute worst thing I can do with a fuel is burn it, right? Uh, and it's very true. Uh, someone told me, I wish I could remember who made this quote because it's a great statement. He said, you know, a flame is a thermodynamic catastrophe, right? I mean, there's just all this irreversible process is going on because you're trying to convert all this chemistry so rapidly, you're inevitably creating this huge amount of entropy as you do that conversion. So, you know, I joke, right? The worst thing you can do with a fuel is burn it because it's not a reversible process. So, in fact, you know, if you, if you use the word exergy or availability, either one are used in different places, when you go down and look at, in this case, this was a combined heat and power, so it's not actually a, uh, it's not like a combined cycle, but this author went through and looked at the exergy or availability destruction for the different components in that cycle. And if you just look down those, you know, you destroy 7.3% in the steam generator, 3.5% in the turbo machinery, in the recuperator, 3%, the compressor, 2.5%. But at the very top of the list is the combustor, right? So you're destroying all that available energy in the combustor as you burn that fuel. So what can I do to change that situation? Well, that's where this idea of pressure gain combustion comes in. Uh, this slide uh, shows very clearly uh, one of the things that I lack, artistic ability, <laughs> that was the best I could do on the computer, to show a steady flame there, you know, with gas flowing through that little triangle. That was my representation of a flame, all right? So I'm taking, you know, kind of nominal like gas turbine condition, 300 bar, uh, 600 Kelvin flowing through that triangle representing a flame, raising the temperature to 1600 Kelvin. So very simple thermodynamics, right? The change in enthalpy from those two states is the heat I put in. And so, you know, an ideal gas sense, specific heat times the change in temperature at constant pressure equals the, the heat that I put in from combustion. So then if I change that from constant pressure combustion to constant volume, right, same description thermodynamically, but it's not the change in enthalpy that matters, it's the change in internal energy that equals that same Q value for the heat input, right? So if I just put in now CV times delta T, you can just go and convince yourself, since CV is less than CP, all right, the temperature rise in this case is quite a bit higher. And what happens to the pressure? I mean, we're talking kaboom, right? I have a lot of availability now in that volume uh, of gas. I guess the main message here is sometimes you don't think about it, but when you burn at constant pressure, you're doing a lot of work just moving gas out of the way, right? That's where that loss of availability is happening. You had the opportunity as that gas is expanding to pull work out of it, but you, for whatever reason, couldn't do it, and so it's lost availability. And that's part of the reason 
why a flame is a thermodynamic disaster, right? You're just losing all that energy at constant pressure. Constant volume helps you maintain that available energy. So to be clear here, if, if you, uh, you know, try to do that process of constant volume combustion, sure you can get greater availability in the products, but what happens if you take that pressure and you just bleed it off again, as I'm showing here, you started there, but maybe you opened a valve or opened a pipe there, the stuff blows out and then it goes back to the same constant pressure end state, right? So my point on this slide is, sure, if I do constant volume combustion, I have a greater av availability, but I better make sure I know how to take advantage of it, right? If I just fritter out and dissipate it, it's no better than constant pressure. And this is really kind of the fundamental challenge for people who are doing constant volume combustion technology, right? I have to do something productive with that available energy is I've held it at constant volume and I want to expand it and do useful work. So we'll see how you might be able to do that in the next couple of slides here. Uh, this is just a, a slide to show kind of a, you know the usual uh, you know temperature entropy diagram for a cycle constant volume versus constant pressure. So I'm showing there the, the uh, you know conventional engine cycle where you have a compressor up on the top there uh, the, the combustor goes through at constant pressure or more realistically with a slight pressure loss as you go through that system. Oh, that laser does not work. Bear with me while I grab a laser pointer that does work. Make this a little bit better. On the, uh, the other side of that graph then there's the, the combustor with pressure gain. Okay, that's better. Yeah, there we go. that's better. So up in here the pressure is actually rising through the combustion process. So if I plot these up either on a pressure volume diagram or temperature entropy diagram, here when I add the heat, I'm adding it at constant volume so I get the higher pressure and temperature up at the top end here. And then I expand out and I'm comparing that to kind of a conventional Brayton cycle. So you'll remember, you know, the area inside of that is the, the work that you're producing for that cycle. Same heat input, more work out of this cycle. And you can see the same thing, but maybe not as clearly on temperature entropy diagram. Here, this is constant pressure heat addition up to this point. Here, it's constant volume heat addition, and you have less entropy at that end state before you go through the turbine expansion. So when you use this, it's almost like you're getting this compression for free, right? Because you're going up to a little bit higher pressure up at this point, and then dropping back down. But the integral TDS under these two curves is the same, the same heat input both processes, but this one has less entropy at the end state before expansion, so more work. So I think this is all clear, I hope, thermodynamically. Let me look around the room, make sure everybody's like, yeah, okay, move on, <laughs> all right. Uh, I do want to point out, before I keep going on this, we're going to talk about detonation combustion, and it doesn't follow these diagrams exactly. It's even better, all right? You'll see how that works in just a minute. So this is a little bit of a simplification but it's to introduce the idea so you'll understand kind of where we're, we're going to go in the next couple slides. Okay, so here's a little bit of history, some prospects for, you know, constant volume or pressure gain combustion. This idea is not new, all right? Uh, this image that you see here, I got to put my glasses on to actually read it uh, right now, but it was out of a oil and gas journal in 1922. Uh, the, the title here was interesting, something about how this was going to be the future of marine power. And it was a turbine, something like what we use today, but it was actually driven by an explosive combustor, right? That was how it was designed. It was really the first, you know, reduction to practice, this idea. is called Howlsworth, Howlsworth Explosion Turbine. And it's fun to go back in and look that article up and just see what they were doing at the time. But it really was a pressure gain combustion concept. And then, you know, there were people that used gas turbines, all right, so-called compound piston turbine engines, where you put a turbine in the middle of the gas, I'm sorry, you put a piston engine in the middle of a gas turbine cycle. It's essentially like today's turbo compounded automotive engines, right? And so you're confining the combustion inside of that piston engine in this embodiment you have shaft horsepower originating from both the turbo machinery and the piston engine. 
So that actually flew. It was used for a number of years. In fact, one article I just saw pointed out something I didn't realize. It still held the record for lowest specific fuel consumption, you know, fuel consumption for brake horsepower power output for a shaft engine until like, I don't know, a year or two back. It was really impressive efficiency from that engine. The reason it kind of left service was, man, it was a parts hog, right? I mean, look at all that machinery, you know, to, to run the engine. You got a piston engine running with a turbine engine, both providing shaft horsepower. So it, it, it was not popular with mechanics or aviators. So it was kind of like, nope, don't want to do that. And uh, of course, engines got bigger and they needed a different uh, geometry. So that went out of production. I want to ask the question before we get into pressure gain combustion. Will we see a reprise of interest in this type of engine configuration with other modern ideas about how to lay it out? And uh, I give two references here. You can go look them up uh, you know, after the end of the seminar here or whatever. Uh, this is a 2016 article where these authors from Europe were proposing to put a compound engine together within kind of the framework of a conventional engine nacelle for flight. They're going to range the pistons around the outer region where normally you'd have this kind of a bulge that goes around the, the outer part of the engine, a lot of avionic or uh, electronic stuff in there. That's where this piston system was going to sit. And they looked at several different options where the pistons provide an increase in pressure, but you don't get mechanical shaft horsepower out of that system. It's just like a free piston system running in there. Or the piston could drive its own shaft. And maybe you could go to electrical power for use elsewhere on the, the vehicle. And then some combination of these. At least as I recall the paper, they, they thought the first one was the best approach for efficiency gains. And it, boy, it sure would be the best one in terms of simplicity, right? Because I don't have to manage the power output from that system. It's just there to drive the downstream turbo machinery. Uh, they use the, coined the phrase hecta pressure ratio because they're saying they want to put this on a you know, high efficiency engine, maybe with a uh, pressure ratio of 60, so you end up inside the piston engine going up to maybe a 100 you know, pressure ratio. So some very, if this thing goes forward, very unique you know, engine conditions, new combustion problems, I'm sure, not to mention new mechanical you know, design issues, stuff like that. So really cool. And then closer to the ground, uh, this uh, 2015 article uh, by John Gullen, uh, talks about how he wanted to turbo compound a reheat cycle. And I won't go into all that cycle, but I'm just pointing out, uh, I, I'm not the only, by the way, I'm very keen on this as a concept, so I'm not the only one who thinks, wow, I think we ought to look at this. Uh, we'll see if it actually takes root and is, is pursued. But it is a very simple way to get to pressure gain combustion, right? Because you're holding the combustion in a piston, which you know is going to effectively extract the power when it expands, right? I could build that. I could make it work. There's a lot of technology to put it all together in a, a functional engine, but uh, it's certainly something to keep your eye on. I put all this slide in here just because I didn't want to talk about pressure gain combustion and for you to walk out thinking, well, I, the only way to get there is these very complex new ideas about combustion proper. You can do it with a piston engine. It's just more complex. Go ahead. in the piston system. I, I have not personally calculated the numbers, but when you think about the experience of the Napier engine I showed you, it was still like the highest efficiency engine and just till recently. But uh, you're raising an excellent question. The heat transfer in that cycle, where would that go in terms of loss? I don't think we know right now, you know. Uh, what a great homework assignment for me. I mean, I want to go think about that now. I'd not thought about it really until you just asked it. So it's a great question. Great question. Any other thoughts here or questions? Let me keep rolling then. Uh, there is a, a lot of interest in pressure gain combustion right now. Uh, I, I think well justified uh, because of some opportunities. I try to keep track of places where I see people talking about it. and. Uh, 
AFRL, our colleague Fred Schauer and some of his coworkers are here today sitting up in the back. You know, he told me about the statement he heard from uh, one of the key people at Rolls-Royce. When we get a 5% pressure loss, kind of typical of what you see in a gas turbine today, and somehow turn that into a 5% gain, it's like lopping off one whole compressor stage. Boy, for a flight engine, that means a lot shorter engine, a lot, of, lot less weight from that section of the engine, right? So you definitely want to think about that for a flight engine. Uh, and then uh, at the time, this 2009 quote, this was in the MIT Technology Review, the Vice President of Advanced Technologies for GE pointed out, boy, we see this potential for 30% fuel efficiency improvement all at once from one technology. There's nothing else you could say. I'm going to put my finger on one thing and I'm going to get this boost in efficiency, right? Wow, that'd be great, you know. I hope we can get there. And then, uh, so those things were there. And then 2013, there was an article Lee Langston put together for uh, uh, ASME's Gas Turbine World. Same, almost at the same time, uh, John Gullen put this article in Gas Turbine World and talked about what at the time, 65% was like, wow, that's a big jump. Isn't it amazing? Just a few years ago, and you know, now we're at 63. So interesting thing is, no matter where that flat curve is going with heat transfer improvements and other improvements, this always adds right on, right? Because I'm taking care of a different efficiency loss fundamental to the process. So let's hope those guys keep that line going up and we add right onto it. Wouldn't that be great, right? So when you, when you guys get to mid-career, I bet we'll be at 70% efficiency. Oh, last one. If you decide you want to do work in this area, please get this article. It's 2017, just from the beginning of the year because it was a special issue in Journal of Propulsion and Power, 15 articles, and some of them I just thought were excellent. They, they were all great, but there were some that just really gave me better insight into the whole process. Uh, the one by Rob Miller is my favorite. Can, am I allowed to endorse a, an article? Uh, it was a really, really good article in there because it was about thermodynamics. All right, nobody's laughing anymore. It's late on Friday here. Okay, let me go right direction here. Oh. And uh, just to finish that thought on interest, you just see the number of citations and articles that are coming out in journals is going up. The, the decline there is only because we're only partway through 2017. I bet you there's going to be a bunch more. So it seems like an area to be paying attention to. So pressure gain combustion outside of the piston engine versions of this. What's the technology approaches that you might use? Where might you apply it? So I tried to color those. Well, technology approaches, you could do something called resonant pulse combustion. We'll talk about that. Uh, uh, Dan Paxson at NASA Glenn has done a lot in this area. This is Rob Miller's work at Cambridge. Uh, and when I actually used to do useful work, I even did some. And unfortunately, the date starts to give you some hint about my age, but that's OK. I'm still feeling young. So we did work on this quite a ways back, and I'll even talk about some of that just for fun. And you got to listen, because what else are you going to listen to? I'll have to tell you about it. It's a great, really great uh, opportunity. I'll explain it in a minute. There's other work going on in detonation. We're going to talk a lot about that. And also confined de uh, deflagration with the uh, uh, IUPU work. We'll talk about that. Pulse detonations. I won't have time or expertise to talk about rocket engine applications, but those are attracting a lot, a lot of interest right now because it's a very good platform to demonstrate the technology. So we'll talk about some of these in the next couple of slides here. So let's begin with pulse deflagration combustion as a route to pressure gain. Uh, this is a, a topic that's it's not at all new. Uh, there have been a number of applications reduced to practice. Uh, this is the uh, so-called pulse jet. That it used, it was the phrase was the buzz bomb. It was a aero, uh, mechanically valve pulse combustor. It buzzed when it flew. But it was used for a period of time before they developed uh, other types of rocket engines. Uh, there's practical applications of pulse deflagration. Uh, does anybody remember the pulse combustion furnace, furnace that was sold for residential by Lennox? It was like back in the 90s. Uh, you probably a lot of you too young, but I mean, you could buy these for your home, and the selling point was the unsteady flow would enhance the heat transfer that you would, you know, get out of the furnace. And so that enabled them to make a little bit smaller furnace with very high efficiency. Um, they worked very well. They were sold. They were low emissions. There was only a drawback that sometimes in installations, even though they were very quiet, 
if they were located at exactly the right distance from your neighbor's house, people would get a, an irritating resonance from that pulse and you could, you could hear it. And so that kind of was a marketing issue for them. They needed to think that one through. But it, I think they were eclipsed just by simpler heat transfer for those applications. But they were sold. You can still buy, I think, a commercial uh, pulse combustion uh, uh, furnace. Uh, pulse jet thermal foggers, you can get on the internet. You can you know, buy those today. They operate on the principles we're going to have here. Uh, some of these things exploit enhanced heat transfer. I said that before. And then if you want to study this area, uh, you know, if you just want some fun type pulse jet bike at the brake, don't do it now, I know you've all got phones, you can do this, but pulse jet bike, there are hobbyists that build these things and power bicycles with them, which is really quite dangerous, so don't try it yourself. Uh, so anyways, you can look that up on the internet, see how pulse jets work. So let's take a look at the physics of what's going on here. This is an aerovalved pulse combustion process. So the way this works, you have a chamber that has an asymmetric inlet and entrance on those two ends. Uh, you burn fuel at a certain point in the cycle. It started with cold air coming in through this end. So air starts, to, combustion products start to rush out of both of those regions. This end is longer, all right? So once you start that flow moving, it's, there's just more inertia in that column of gas and it will eventually draw that air back in from the other direction and refill the thing with air ready for combustion. So, you know, the, the point, thing I want to point out here is it's not symmetric and that's how it works. It's not symmetric geometrically and it's also not symmetric in terms of thermal history, right? I mean, when that air comes in, it's dense and it's cold once the thing fires, it's hot and, you know, it's, it's not dense anymore. So there's no way you're going to push out as much as what came in on the cold cycle. And you have this region, which basically stays hot, and you've got that inertia to empty the thing. So a very clever balance between those will allow the thing, once you light it, to just keep oscillating. You know, it's just a resonator, and that's how it works. You don't need any mechanical valves. It can actually operate, and it has some inherent diodicity because the ACE the asymmetry geometrically and also thermally. So what do you do with it? We looked at this, like I said, I'm giving away my age here, you know, a long time ago. Uh, it's, it's an interesting kind of history lesson because at that time, for us to do a CFD simulation of this process, it really wasn't possible. You know, they're just, the, the codes would not allow you to do a temporal simulation. We tried some things, but they just, I mean, they wouldn't converge, it would take forever. So we ended up doing very simple models for combustion, heat transfer, all the things you need to, just defining these things sort of in bulk flow and so you ended up with a set of ODEs and you know, there you go, I can describe the process. And so we put one together in the lab uh, because we didn't have very good modeling, we made the thing very easy to take apart and did a kind of a geometric study. It was interesting because even though we didn't have very sophisticated models at the time, we were pretty much able to capture the behaviors we saw in terms of you know, the RMS amplitude that we saw comparing the model to the experiment over different airflow rates. And then this was the pressure difference from the inlet uh, down into the combustor in the mean sense. So the way I defined it right there, that positive number wasn't what we were after. It was actually a pressure loss, right? You know, the pressure was dropping in a mean sense as you move through the system. But we just wanted to get a model that would work, at least close, and then identify what parameters do we need to adjust geometrically to actually achieve a pressure gain. And so we, we actually did that. We uh, used the model that I showed there. And at some conditions, you would run the thing over a certain airflow range. And this negative value, the way we define the pressure gain, we would get some pressure gain uh, from the actual experiment. It wasn't a lot, but it was proof. Yeah, I can actually get this thing to achieve pressure gain. Shouldn't be a surprise because, as I said, there's people that build these hobbyists to create gains, to create thrust. It's a known phenomenon. We just wanted to figure out, well, how do I do this so it wasn't completely empirical? And so we said, all right, let's take what we learn and try and see if we can actually use this in an engine cycle. So we actually put one, one of the few times it had been done up until that point, inside of a pressurized vessel and ran it. And uh, you know, this was a, as a rig we, we were using for gas turbine combustion studies. It's a great experiment, and we actually ran it. 
and uh, we actually achieved some pressure gain right over there. They were achieved, you know, at elevated pressure is what we expected. But we never got forward to actually pursuing this for an engine. You know, the question is, well, why didn't you do that, right? You got gain right there. Well, there was a lot of issues that we still had to address. We could see that coming. An interesting sidebar story, right while we were doing this, the engine technology for gas turbines was adopting widely DLN combustion, low emission combustion, premix combustion. The number one problem with those combustors, they went in operation, they would all oscillate. Bad combustion dynamics. I mean, people, engines, you know, running into problems during operation. Exact same physics that we were studying here. We couldn't keep up with business at the time. I and mean, there was so much need for people to be studying and solving combustion dynamics. We moved all of our research to address that. And, uh, and did that for a few years. It was just good timing. We were working on unsteady combustion right when there was a need. Uh, so it's just fortuitous. So we sort of stopped working on it. We knew there was a whole bunch of barriers to actually put this into an engine. As I mentioned on a slide a couple back there, there were people uh, now again starting to pick up the idea of using pressure gain. And so I'm showing you here some of the issues that they need, needed to address and are addressing. So there's a couple ways to combine that pressure gain into an actual engine. You could imagine taking that tube out of a number of pressure gain combustors and trying to direct it right into the turbo machinery. Right? So I'm just saying I'm going to let that flow oscillate and go right into the turbine and recover power that way. Well, that's good. Uh, this is actually a simul... I'm sorry. This was both simulation and experiments that were done uh, by Rob Miller at, at Cambridge University. And so what he's showing here is that unsteady jet impacting the turbine uh, cascade right there. The, the colors show you the pressure gain relative to the baseline uh, compressor discharge. And so above yellow is positive. I can't quite see it right there. Above yellow is positive. So right up in here you can see He's got a little bit of pressure gain right in that region during that part of the cycle. But then the blue, it ends up as the vortices roll around that thing, it changes the pressure distribution on the airfoil, and you lose the gain that you were hoping to achieve aerodynamically. Remember a couple slides back, I said if I do pressure gain combustion, and I'm not careful about how I do the expansion, I lose what I'm trying to achieve. And so that's what he started to see when I put this unsteady flow into the, the turbo machinery. I have a lot of unsteady flow to manage and recover energy in the turbo machinery. So an alternative is, well, why don't I try to actually shroud the exit of the combustor. And this, this plot, I'll turn the movie on here in a second. The combustor is symmetric, but what we're seeing on the top is a plot in this simulation of temperature on top and fuel mass fraction on the bottom. And then this is actually a shroud that's built. The end of the combustor is right here to try to take that unsteady flow and entrain the surrounding flow so you have a net rise in stagnation pressure. And this was actually done numerically, but then also uh, in an actual experiment where there was a, a liquid fueled aerovalve combustor, it's mechanically valved, I'm sorry, and there was an automotive turbocharger wrapped around it as the, the turbine. So it's, it's one of the few cases where somebody actually put the turbine together with the pressure gain combustor, ran the whole cycle, and they achieved a pressure ratio of about not, not, a, not quite 4%, 3.5% at a you know, overall pressure ratio of 2.2. So it's a small experiment, but very compelling, right? Because he's showing I can do this in turbo machinery, I can get pressure gain and, and make it actually work. Oh, I said I was going to run the movie. So here we go. Take a look at the vortices rolling up in this region. I should have blown that up a little bit. You can see here's the cycle going. and. What you're seeing is this mixing here. We're actually entraining the flow from around the combustor going through this ejector region so you actually then recover that energy uh, in the region that you go downstream. And so th this is an example where there's a way to take that unsteady flow and achieve experimentally confirmed pressure gain. It's actually pretty useful. Remember I said pressure gain of even 5% a couple slides back? Well, here you got 35 in a non-optimized experiment. Right? It was just a, they laid it out, did, the, did, did as much analysis as they could. You could probably get even higher, spend a little bit more time optimizing it. So it can work. A different approach to pressure gain, shown on this slide, uh, is not, not to try to use an aerodynamic valve or a, you know, a, a reed valve like in the prior one, but instead use a thing called a wave rotor. And the way this works, 
there's a rotor that takes the compressor discharge air. So this is not the turbo machinery. This is really the combustor, except the combustion is placed into these channels in this drum, which rotates at some speed that you can select. You drive the rotation with a mechanical drive. It, it's not like you're producing any power or even drawing a lot of power. You're just spinning that to create a valve behavior in these channels that are rotating around. So the inlet is here and the outlet is here and the combustion channels rotate and carry the mixture around this way from the inlet. Combustion happens and moves up through the channel and then arrives at the outlet as that system is turning. Is it clear what you're looking at? The way he drew this, he actually then unwrapped those channels and you can see them in here now. So this is taking this round device and unwrapping it and here you can see the entering flow, the cold right here, moving into those channels and then the channels are being driven up as it rotates. Combustion is occurring, there's a combustion wave, you can see the fuel is added just on this side. Combustion occurs and actually propagates back into the mixture as that thing is rotating around. But what's interesting is once it leaves this region, that combustion is completely confined, right? You've got it inside of that channel and that channel is rotating around with the rest of the drum and now it's, the combustion is occurring inside of that region. So this, this doesn't require any like detonation or special you know, type of combustion. It just needs to be fast enough to combust inside of that chamber and rotate around and then eject the higher pressure out the back end. And uh, it really does work. Uh, you know, you can look up this paper. Uh, they ran like 30 tests on it. Uh, the, the beneficial idea here is, you know, you have almost steady airflow, right? I mean, it's just going in, those openings are continually passing, air is continually entering. And you look at the outlet side, exhaust is continually coming out. So in principle, a great idea, you know, you could really engineer this to work well, and they have. They've gotten some successful tests. Uh, Aerodyne is a company that's spun out. Maybe they'll succeed in marketing and building these devices. Uh, the, uh, the challenges that are obviously there is you have to seal that while it's rotating, right? So that's, that's the issue with this approach is that sealing becomes uh, a problem. But I'm very interested in that work. I think uh, Phil... Phil Snyder and Rosie Nellum have done a great job leading their team to show that that's a good approach. So we're going to switch to one more idea for pressure gain combustion called pulse detonation. And, uh, you know, pulse detonation, you know, detonation essentially traps combustion behind a shock wave. So here you're confining the combustion because it's going so fast the air can't get out of the way. You have a shock wave ahead of it, right? And so that's how you get constant volume combustion. It's an interesting idea and compared to pulse deflagration, you can get a lot higher pressure gains. Uh, it, and I used to say, I used to ask the question, is this the only place, only way I could think of, I mean, what do you do with detonations usually? It's usually destructive, right? Here you're trying to take a detonation and do something useful with it. Well, uh, you know, the question I pose there, is this the only constructive use of detonations? I more recently have learned absolutely not there are people that are using detonations for synthesis, material synthesis. I'm not aware of any gas phase material synthesis, but solid phase, yeah, there are people that make commercial quantities of nano diamonds. How many of you know what a nano diamond is? I wasn't aware until I started looking at that literature, you know, uh, nano diamond. But they're used for, you know, a number of industrial purposes. And uh, you can go look that up on the internet. I think you'll be quite interested to see there are people using detonations for a lot of things besides uh, this potential power application. Okay, so here's what happens with pulse detonation engine cycle. It's sort of like pulse deflagration, but not quite. What you do is you have a tube, pretty straightforward, go through a fill process where you put fuel and air mixture into that region. It's sitting there at ambient. Uh, you close the inlet supply with a valve. You're now full of fuel air mixture. You ignite the end of it with a spark, with something, and a wave begins to propagate up through that mixture. Uh, eventually, it goes from deflagration to detonation and then starts propagating as a true detonation at the so-called detonation velocity or chapman jugay CJ velocity. So that thing is now flying through that tube. The detonation comes out of the tube. The gas behind it 
is that elevated pressure, right? And so then it comes flying out, and you have suddenly realized I could, I could really propel something with that, right? It's like I have this explosion that I'm allowing now to go out the end of that tube. Uh, and then, you know, as that pressure's dropping down, there's a rarefaction that travels back upstream to exhaust the rest of that gas, lower the pressure, and then, uh, you know, as you open the end, it'll help purge out and allow the fresh mixture to flow into the device, and you just keep repeating that, right? So that's pulse uh, detonation cycle. And this has been reduced to practice very significantly, and now it's actually quite a ways back there. Uh, now, I remember when this work was getting started, it was really interesting. Can you really do this? You know, can you really put this in an engine? And uh, it's, it's pretty simple for propulsion, right? You don't need any turbo machinery. In fact, the lab tests, and I believe probably even the flight test of this thing that was done at uh, the group at Wright-Patterson, the inlet was nothing more than the cylinder head out of an automobile engine, right? They just drove the valves with a, drove the cam train with a, you know, a different motor and then allowed it to operate. And you can see four tubes right here detonating. And this was actually then installed in an uh, aircraft and, you know, they flew the aircraft on it. Really quite interesting. Uh, I, I think that aircraft is on display at Wright Pat. Yeah, so if you go to the Air Force Museum, which I'm going to be there in a couple weeks. I haven't seen this engine, so I'm going to go, look, or the uh, aircraft, I'm going to go see if I can get a good, uh, good look at it. But that was flown in 2008. Uh, really interesting idea. One of the things you bump into to make this an efficient engine is, don't forget, when the cycle of combustion starts, it doesn't start as a detonation. Right? Somehow it's got to go from ignition as a simple deflagration up to a true detonation. So you lose a little bit in that process of going from deflagration to detonation. You can see that's important for RDE and other things as well, because if, if the fuel just burns it as a deflagration, it's burning at constant pressure, right? So you still get that entropy increase for that part of the process. Got to avoid that. So a lot of fundamental issues here in terms of how do you, you know, organize things to get uh, a quick transition to, to detonation. Question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to say, right, for a variety of reasons. I just don't want to go down that road. So, I can say in an actual flight, in actual ground-based power application, people have used the same kind of technology with fuels that will detonate, right? So, uh, there was a significant amount of work trying to apply this to actually uh, shipboard power, so these are gas turbines for ship operation. And then this paper, which was, uh, I'm sorry, 2007, yeah, they actually put this together and put it into a land-based power generating turbine, all right? So really interesting, they ran the thing for 144 minutes. At least in their test, they state the turbine performance was not really impacted by having this, you know, unsteady oscillating combustion. So. So people have put these in actual engines, they've run them, they do work. Uh, as of today, no one is selling a commercial engine with this technology in it. I think there's a reason why, because I think people are starting to see there might be a, a different way to do this, which we'll get to in a minute with an RDE. So we'll take a look at that in a slide or two coming up here. So this is, this is where kind of pulse detonation engines are at. And uh, I want to now get to the thermodynamics of these things and just give you a little thought experiment here and then we'll take a look at a movie and break here. But this is an instructive question because I said before, a detonation can do a little bit better as a pressure gain device than a deflagration or an, than a constant volume combustion process. So again, let me say it one more time, a detonation can do just a little bit better in terms of pressure gain than constant volume. Well, how can that be? Right? And it wasn't so obvious to me. I had to spend a lot of time thinking about why is that the case? So here's a little experiment to think through. You have a tube full of fuel and air that's open on one end, and here you have one that's closed on that far end. And so I'm going to start a combustion process and just imagine it transitions in both cases the same way up to a detonation. So on the top, this uh, let me start with the bottom one first. The lower one, this wave is going to move forward and hit the end, and eventually that wave will be dissipated, and it will be constant volume combustion, right? 
and close both ends, truly constant volume combustion. If I go up to the top, you have this detonation wave flying out, but it doesn't get stopped, right? It just flies out the end. Both devices release the same heat and burn the same amount of fuel. This top device, right as the detonation gets to the end of the tube, there's a lot of mechanical energy behind that wave, right? I mean, it's come flying out of there. In the lower case, I just close it off and I dissipate it. In the upper case, if I'm clever, I can do work with it. I can propel an airplane. So you sit back and think about that and you realize, yeah, there's a fundamental difference between those two situations, right? And it's this one that gives you more available energy that you can use. Here you choose to keep it confined and dissipate the energy behind that detonation. So they are two different things. There is a difference between just pure constant volume and letting it go to a detonation. And you know, you'll see this in a minute. It has to do with the way the detonation processes the fuel. Here, in fact, here it is the next couple of slides. We got about I think, 10 minutes to a break, so hang with me here. So I'll show this now you know, more directly, right? This is uh, you know, ideal Brayton cycle gas turbine. You go from one up to two, you add heat uh, at constant pressure as in the way it's currently done today, that's this line. And then if you add it at constant volume, you go up on this line and then expand, all right? So my point on this slide is how you add the heat this way, constant volume, or this way, really affects the thermodynamic cycle, right? You knew that before I told you, but I just want to emphasize, because what I'm not showing here is, well then, what do you do with a detonation? Where does it go on these charts? Because I said it's, it's a little bit better, right? Next slide here. So to understand that, you need to look at the details of what's going on in this detonation. So I'm showing, here's this detonation traveling down the tube. There, over here is the head of an expansion wave. And it, it's hard for me sometimes to keep all the mechanics of how this works in my head. But that detonation wave, right, the pressure jumps up, you go through there. And then, at least in the uh, absolute, absolute fixed frame of reference, right, you're standing looking at it while it's fixed, you'll see that gas rushing behind that wave to keep up. Well, where in the world can that come from? I must have an expansion wave behind it, right? So that's why the velocity field looks the way it does, right? Right behind that detonation, as I've shown it here, high velocity, and then there's an expansion back behind here. The pressure is dropping to that region where the gas, in an ideal sense, is quiescent. It's sitting there, so the chamber is now filled with stagnant gas at high pressure. That's how the, how the detonation processes the fuel, raises the pressure behind that. So what does the temperature entropy diagram look like for a particle of gas that's being processed by this detonation. Here it is. Same picture, but now I'm showing a close-up of what's going on inside the actual detonation structure itself. If you look, you know, that tiny little region where that detonation is confined to, there is a shock wave and then the temperature is ramped up enough to drive the reactions forward. It's being followed by the reaction zone right behind it. So if you look at that on a temperature entropy diagram, this was the top of that curve I just showed you. Constant pressure heat addition to this point. Constant volume heat addition to this point. Now if I look at the detonation process, I'm going from that starting point two up through, an, up through that uh, uh, shock wave. So there's an increase in entropy and the details of what happens along that path, I show it as kind of a broken line because, I mean, what's the entro how does the entropy increase inside a shock wave? Not real clear physics right in there. And then once you get through that shock, you get to the front where reactions are occurring. So now you're adding heat. And in fact, at certain conditions, the TS diagram does in fact turn over because you're getting right up to sonic conditions there where you're doing the heat addition. So if you go in and look that up in a gas dynamic textbook, that's what it'll look like. Again, my point on this slide is how you add the heat determines that final state. So um, I put this slide together to just emphasize, you know, how does this work with constant volume combustion versus a detonation? They add heat in different paths. All right, it's easy to understand the one where you've got constant volume versus constant pressure. Through the detonation, a little bit harder because there's more physics going on. But again, it's how you add the heat really determines the final end state. And that final end state 
determines what the total cycle performance can be. All right? So there's kind of the thermodynamics of a detonation wave, how it you know, processes the fuel and creates a pressure gain. And I, it helps me to understand it to just draw an analog here. When, when I started working in this area and reading the literature, it just bugged me that everybody was talking about a PDE, a pulse detonation engine, an RDE, a rotating detonation engine. I keep looking at it thinking, it's a combustor for, for crying out loud, why are you calling it an engine? What's this engine thing? Because it is an engine, right? It's, it's a thermal mechanical engine all done with aerodynamics. Let me show you that. So I'm drawing in a picture of the, uh, the detonation and then I'm, I'm drawing what I hope you will endure as a loose analog, not exact, but it just it helps me to frame it up in how this thing works, right? Shock wave does compression. Almost like in a gas turbine, you compress gas. Then you get this reaction zone that adds heat in the detonation, almost like a combustor in an engine, right? Then behind that, you get an expansion wave, right, that converts that to initially velocity and then eventually pressure, right? That's like the turbine part of this thing. That's why it's a rotating, that's why it's a pulse detonation engine. Because it really is its own cycle. Now when I saw that, I'm like, wow, I have this aerodynamic power cycle. It, it really is its own engine. And when you couple it into a conventional gas turbine, you put that in as a part of the combustion process itself, you suddenly created a combined cycle between this, I call it a gas dynamic engine, and the conventional engine that it, you know, is wrapped around it, right? I, that's just incredible, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, to me, that's just a very clever and elegant way to generate power. So. I don't know if you get any points in the economic world for having clever and elegant technologies, but it, it's a great idea. The question for all of us is, can we reduce it to practice, right? That's what we're trying to do. So uh, if you get into this area, I put a few notes on here just for you to think about. Uh, one, I don't know that I mentioned, I might have neglected it. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'll answer that question just a sl one more slide. Hang on, okay? Um, I want to just add a couple of comments here, and I'll, we'll, I think we'll get that question and then break. So hang with me here. Uh, a couple of cautions if you start to read this literature. One thing that I stumble over still as I'm trying to understand this, when you're reading a paper or thinking about the physics of the process, make sure you know which frame of reference you're talking about, right? Because when I look at like an analysis of a detonation, Typically, you do the analysis in a moving frame of reference, right? Because then it's just shock relations with heat addition, and it's in a moving frame of reference, and so the velocities will, to you, look like they're exiting the back end of the fixed detonation. Of course, in the real device, if you're standing next to it, you're not moving with the detonation, and so it's being ejected out the back end, so it looks backwards. And you get yourself confused when you try to think about the path line of a particle. So just pay attention because it's, it, it's almost like when you do turbo machinery analysis, right? You can ride with the moving blade and then the flow angles look different than if you were in the fixed frame of reference. So you need to know what frame of reference you're looking at when you're reading a paper or just thinking about the physics. First lesson. The second one, uh, you know, when you think about the thermodynamics, realize these are unsteady processes when you're standing in the fixed frame of reference, right? They're going by you and so the pressure is changing and so that changes how you look at the conservation of energy, right? Because you have an unsteady term in there that in most problems, when you're used to being a combustion engineer, you don't put that in there. So you just, you kind of forget that when you do the analysis. So be, be, be cautious as, as you start to read this literature because I know I've gotten tripped up just by forgetting those things. So question on the thermodynamics. I think that's the next slide. Yes, okay. I, I, I could spend, you know, hours talking about thermodynamics. 
but it's almost break time, so I'm off the hook, and so are you. But the question you raised about the thermodynamic comparison, I think the first reference there takes it on pretty well, the, the Pratt and Heiser reference is 2002. Uh, and there's a couple other ones in here. I don't remember which one to direct you to. Oh, the one I think by uh, uh, you, the 2003 Wu, Ma, and Yang down there, he's got a really good analysis of what that temperature entropy diagram looks like. So you can find the specific details in there. But in total sense, you can get more efficiency, right? As long as you can engineer it into the system. So, all right, now let me just see, because I think we'll break here. Ah. Do one more slide. I just want to point out we've glossed over many, many details of detonation here. Detonations do not move as truly planar, you know, structures in a flow. In fact, I've got on the slide here, you'll see that the ends of a tube that confine it are steadily reflecting information from the walls across that planar surface. And so you'll see these, you know, cellular structures if you look at an actual detonation image or movie. And when we come back from the break, uh, I, I, I actually have two movies to show you from Elaine Oran at U University of Maryland, which are just excellent images of detonation. So uh, take a 15 minute break, come back at 3.15 here, and we'll watch some really interesting images of detonation waves moving through a mixture. <laughs>